Life is full of mysterious circumstances. And back in the Stone Age, one of these mysteries uh, came into manifestation for which we have never found an adequate interpretation. The people of the early Stone Age began to develop a certain ability, rather restricted but indicative of things to come, uh, to carve, cut, or shape various materials into likenesses or similitudes of objects. And during this period, practically all of these artifacts were of a purely physical or natural order. Uh, there were scratchings representing bison or ancient animals. There were carvings to represent fish. But everything that was done was apparently derived from the authority of nature. These people made pictures as best they could of the things that they could see. And apparently, uh, the entire project was either of vanity or of historical recording. It's quite possible that the tribe attempted to perpetuate outstanding achievements of its members, or an individual sought to gain recognition for some deed of special distinction by carving himself a medal instead of waiting for someone else to hand it to him. In any event, this early period was marked by man beginning to make pictures. He wrote them on the walls of cliffs. He carved them in great masses of rock. They were all primitive, all very simple, all very obvious, and sometimes a little humorous. Then somewhere along the line in this mystery of the Stone Age, things changed. And then the second half of the Stone Age period, as we broadly consider it, the carvings progressed and advanced, at least they continued, but all of a sudden, practically every figure, every image, every likeness became religious. Now what suddenly changed our remote ancestors' point of view, we have absolutely no way of knowing today. But for some reason, in a comparatively short time, his secular art was transformed into a sacred art. The possibilities are, of course, that the talismanic factor began to suggest itself. The man who created a likeness of something and wore this likeness perhaps experienced what he regarded as a protective circumstance, some streak of good fortune struck his primitive way of doing things. He may have been saved from some terrible emergency and accredited this salvation to this figure or this image which he had cut. In any event, in the later part of the Stone Age, man became a designer of sacred images. Nearly everything developed meaning, and this flowering of change was so rapid that it was to influence practically all art from that time on. From the late Stone Age, therefore, to the present time, sacred art has had a continuing existence. In some periods it was more prominent than in others but it has never ceased. A man has continued uh, to create, create likenesses of value, likenesses of principles, or of truths, or of ideas, which he held to be very important. Now, there's no doubt in the world that our most ancient artists were
were limited by their implements. They had to work with comparatively soft substances. They could not drill into any hard material. They could not successfully chip away into any reasonable likeness, uh, difficult or heavily grained substances. Yet we do find at a comparatively early time the beginning of the arrowhead and the chipping of stone. Among our North American Indians, the art of the making of arrowheads from various materials, some of them quite hard and difficult to work. This art developed with amazing skill. And today, our ethnologists in this country are very anxious to preserve the old formulas, if they can, by means of which these arrowheads were so perfectly shaped with so little equipment. Down south of the border in the Aztec Maya complex, obsidian or volcanic glass began to be worked. In working this material, the danger of destroying the implement in the process of making it was very distinct and real. Yet we have found a tremendous number of finely cut obsidian objects, one of the most homely, useful, and mysterious of all being the obsidian razor blade. It may not be generally realized that the Central American Indian found that he could give himself a first-rate shave with this prototype of our familiar Gillette number. But in the old days, the obsidian glass could be chipped until its edge was as sharp as steel. And these razor blades cut from volcanic glass are some of them eight to 10 inches in length, an inch wide, and probably a 16th to a 32nd of an inch thick, with a very powerful cutting edge, sometimes uh, in honor of our modern concept, double-edged. These uh, processes of working must have been exceedingly difficult with the equipment available. In fact, some of these problems of old times have led people to assume that our ancestor must have had some metaphysical means of chipping stone. But the Indians of our Southwest have pretty well demonstrated the traditional skill handed down from generation to generation can accomplish most of the wonders that we are able to recover from the past. So while the ancient man was creating his adornments and his various images and fetishes and so forth, he was also accumulating something else. He was accumulating an interesting collection of bright colored pebbles. These bright colored pebbles, he couldn't do anything with at that time. They were too difficult for him to work. He did not understand them, but they were pretty. So he proceeded to keep them. And we find that uh, occasionally he would find a natural one that had an interesting or remarkable shape or came so near to fulfilling some mental image of his own that he did try desperately uh, to work the stone a little, just to emphasize the point which he intended to make. These bright stones and pebbles became more and more fascinating as abilities and methods improved. Actually, researching into the uh, field suggests an interesting psychological aspect to this. For we know that bright objects, such as our Stone Age ancestors uh, rather enjoyed collecting, have also intrigued a number of birds, animals, and even reptiles. It is not uncommon to find uh, that birds, particularly a certain type of crow, uh, will gather up all kinds of bright objects that have no value whatever in nest building and arrange them in a pleasant design in front of the nest. They will frequently set them in openings or uh, branch, branchings of trees near the nest. In other words, they're going to get as nice and handsome uh, a situation as possible 
Perhaps these crows were among the earliest of all the status seekers. They were trying to excel their neighbors in the glory of their possessions. Monkeys have much the same tendency. Any bright or unusual object will attract their attention. And they are well known in many parts of Asia for their thievery. They will steal anything that is bright or interesting. One of their favorites being a pair of eyeglasses, which they will carefully remove from the owner so deftly that he hardly misses them uh, until he tries to read something or something of that nature. Animals will do this. And apparently the fascination lies in a bright, shining object. Now these bright, shining objects seem to have another kind of fascination. Birds and some animals will remain for a long period of time in a perfectly silent condition, just looking at a bright object. This object seems to have a certain fascination or hypnotic effect upon the creature. And apparently, if we are to believe the old books and writing, these bright objects had a similar effect upon man. And in the course of time, this uh, collection of interesting, crude, bright, pretty objects became involved in his artistry and in his religion. And many very early images have been encrusted or inset with crude, uncut stones. Stones that were simply put there because they were pretty. It was only a, a little step, of course, from this situation uh, to man trying to improve these stones in one way or another, releasing from them more of their brilliance and their interest. Every step of the process is not known or recorded. But after a certain period of time, we find ancient man learning to cut stones. Not only learning to make interesting designs and figures, but gradually devising ways to release the natural luster or shine of the stone itself. The old methods were very slow, and it took sometimes years to polish a single gem. But the interest and the drama of the stone apparently more than justified the labor. It is almost certain that more than decoration was intended, however. The stone must have attained already to a certain magical or talismanic importance. There had to be something of believing in the development of this art as in practically all other arts known to man. By the time the first pages of history, as we know history, uh, were recorded, the art of the stonecutter was distributed throughout the entire world. This is one of the most universal of all arts and crafts. And uh, more and more, the cut gem had become associated with the highest value, uh, with wealth, with honor, distinction. Uh, even in old times, there was a sort of caste system set up. Certain jewels or gems could only be worn by persons of certain estates. The highest and the finest and the rarest, of course, always being reserved either for the head of the state or for the highest of the religious leaders of the area. Uh, images of deities were more and more ornamented. Uh, jewelry began to combine the working of metals with the insetting of stones. And in the very early time of our history, these beautiful objects were made, which are still excavated or found in the tombs of the old Egyptian kings. So we know that the belief in the value and importance of precious stones and even semi-precious ones, this belief has descended to us, gathering along the way a variety of lore, many dramatic and amazing legends, good and bad, have associated themselves with this subject. Naturally, the moment anything becomes valuable, it becomes also uh, a center for a certain amount of crime or of evil doing. 
And uh, man early discovered uh, that the value of the rare stone caused it often to be associated with tragedy. There's an old legend bearing on this that uh, is rather intriguing, I think. In the very dawn of things, when God created human beings, he wanted to give them everything that would be pleasant and interesting. So he made in the uh, meadows and in the mountains and in the valleys wonderful plants and flowers with many colored blossoms that were extremely charming and had wonderful fragrance and covered the world with beauty. And primitive peoples began to admire and love these flowers, and they made them into offerings for their deities and into decorations for themselves. And they lived very happily with these beautiful flowers, which were so common that no one really put any particular value upon them. They were available to all and a source of common joy. About this time, the devil came along and felt it was up to him to do something about this pleasant state of affairs. So he took all of the stone, uh, he took all of the flowers and he made stones like them. And he hid these stones in the earth. And he uh, told people that the stones were not too common, that with great industry they could be found, and that they could be made into very permanent and valuable ornamentations. And everyone thanked the devil for the information. And they all went to work digging for these uh, flowers of gem that were hidden in the earth. And they found them and they made all these things. But because they were permanent and because they were scarce, people envied each other. And very soon these precious stones led to sorrow and crime and misery and death. So that the devil introduced this valuable object to take the place of a common beauty that we could all and in so doing, set up the way of evil over possessions and over beautiful objects. This, of course, is a legend that arose from the common experience of man. It became possible to consider going to war with your neighbor for his jewels, for his valuable things. And as material objects increased in value, covetousness increased in the souls of men leading to all kinds of misfortunes. It is interesting and perhaps worthy of attention that for a very long time there have been set and definite opinions about precious and semi-precious stones. Opinions that are entirely contrary to our modern thinking. Yet who shall say that there might not be more to them uh, then we are inclined to suspect. We are inclined to assume that superstitions simply represent old wives' tales, that they come down to us with no real meaning, simply the accumulated notions of generations. But as we look more closely into the beliefs of peoples, we become more fascinated by the basic integrities that underlie often distorted or exaggerated accounts. There seems to be some possibility that there is meaning or value or purpose behind some of these old stories. It is quite possible that the precious stone is more important to us, uh, psychologically at least, than we have ever realized or considered. So let's take a few of the types of problems that uh, came up in connection with this area and see what we can make out of it. First of all, practically all ancient carvings of precious stones or the settings for which they were prepared have some kind of symbolic meaning. Uh, these stones became associated with occasions with purposes, with special meanings. And in their intricate settings in the 18th and 19th centuries, for example, these stones became words. And there was a method of crypto cryptography by means of which an inscription 
could actually be, con be concealed in a piece of jewelry by the arrangement and colors of the stones used. That there were many ingenious devices of this kind, we know. But out of the very beginning of this thinking came the conviction that stones had some kind of innate power of themselves. That the stone was perhaps not a living thing as we commonly think of life, but that it had an aliveness in it. That the stone was a vital thing, and that the emanations which came from it were real, and had some kind of distinct and definite influence. This kind of thinking has been recorded in hundreds of earlier texts on stones, minerals, and on talismanic objects. We also know that from the early period it was assumed that if a stone was engraved or a further likeness of something was cut into the surface of the stone or perhaps raised in relief from its surface, that this additional specialized uh, cutting gave further meaning and further importance to the stone itself. Therefore, it was common to place upon the surface or into the surface of the stone inscriptions or likenesses regarded as having religious or magical meaning. When this occurred, this magical meaning was released became active in the life of the individual, and the um, piece of jewelry became a talisman, or a, an amulet, or a fetish of some kind, a thing of power. Our modern psychologists will simply say that it was believing that did it, that the stone itself had no particular meaning, but that belief in the stone certainly could produce very marked variations in conduct. In fact, psychology today accepts that symbolic objects can profoundly influence the human mind, first because of the presence of mystery in relationship to the object, and second because the design or the decoration related to some traditional belief long held to be important, therefore sharing its importance uh, with each generation. Someone tried to make some form of survey of this subject to find out to what degree modern man had overcome this old superstition. To what degree does modern man in the Western world, we'll say, still hold to various superstitions about the importance of talismanic objects, gems, and the like. Of course, no very clear survey could be made, but the indication was definite that the belief in these different uh, talismanic values is probably today as great as it ever was in the history of the world. That so-called education uh, science, modern way of life, these have had very little actual influence. Uh, one answer, of course, is that man has become increasingly involved in hazards. Life has become continuously more complicated, and in the complication of things, law and order seem to disappear. We live still in a world of miracles of mysteries, of hopes and fears, of joys and sorrows, of uh, optimisms and of pessimisms. And wherever persons are engaged in these kinds of careers in which uncertainties are ever present, these persons still seem to need or believe that they need all the good luck they can get. And this good luck is often involved in talismanic objects of one kind or another. Uh, this type of thinking has always been very prevalent among theatrical people, whose uh, career is especially hazardous, economically speaking. 
It is also a common fact that most persons engaged in dangerous occupations have some recourse to magic or mystery in connection with the things that they do. Uh, it is also known, for instance, that a very large percentage of the men who went to war carried sacred medals, medallions, or blessed objects in the hopes of protecting themselves by this means. Those who cared for them and waited at home also kept a variety of such objects. Uh, most persons in such occupations as aviation and so on have a tendency to want good luck charms and things that give some semblance of protection. And the stories of those who have defied this or have neglected to keep their charms handy, uh, this, these stories are also uh, rather clearly indicated that uh, the loss of this fortunate object had a very detrimental effect upon the psychology of the person. So from the most primitive to the most civilized, man still has a belief in magic locked somewhere in his nature. For the most part, this belief is subjective, but it comes out occasionally in periods of stress or tension. The development of gems for various purposes of a magical or mysterious nature uh, probably began somewhere between 10 and 20,000 years ago. It reached a comparatively high degree of integration and organization by the beginning of the historic periods, which commence about 5,000 years before the beginning of the Christian era. From that time on, the collections and accumulations of sacred gems and stones or magical objects of this nature, these are reported in practically all important books dealing with their times. Uh, we might expect, and it is true, that the city of Alexandria in North Africa became closely associated with this peculiar cult also. The cult of the talisman flourished there at an old, old time, perhaps as a result of it being a crossroad between the East and Europe. In Alexandria, there were entire organizations that did nothing but cut talismanic stones. And of course, to a measure, the Egyptians of the earlier period, through their scarabs and other symbolic and talismanic objects, had already gone far in the unfoldment of these magical beliefs. The use of stones for religious and symbolic purposes also appears early in the rise of Christianity. And I think we may say that by the end of the first century, uh, the stone as relic had already occurred. And by the fifth century, it was almost universal throughout Christendom. And pilgrims traveling in various parts of the world nearly always carried either metals or substances of some nature, inscribed stones, often with the mark of the cross or of the fish or some other early Christian symbol, as a protection. Some of them probably perished for their protections, because many of these early travelers were killed for the jewels that they carried. But for the most part, they held uh, that these stones were a source of help. Pythagoras is also known in Greece to have carved or caused to be carved mathematical and geometrical symbols upon stones and upon metals uh, to be used uh, for worship or for magic or for various ways of controlling elements and things of that nature. The stone then does present us with a, a very interesting series of problems. The various precious stones, of course, are for the most part chemical compositions. And uh, the question still remains whether these stones do emanate any kind of a potent energy or have any distinct or definite effect upon human consciousness. Brightness 
uh, glitter we know is highly attractive. We also know that a beautiful stone, beautifully finished and polished and cut, is an object of beauty, that it is therefore subject to admiration, that the individual finds a pleasure or joy in seeing it, and for hundreds of years people have had a great joy in possessing these objects. But whether this goes any further is a question that has never been satisfactorily answered. Color, of course, ties immediately into the very base of the problem. Here psychology knows there is a valid ground, namely that color does affect consciousness, that color can have a definite therapeutic reaction, and also that it can cause, apparently, sickness or pain or distress. As these various stones were more or less fountains of colored light, that from them either there was a glitter, a glisten, or a gleam, and that this um, emanation conveyed color very quickly and sharply to the subconscious faculties of man, this there can be no reasonable doubt about. Actually, we have a knowledge now through the spectrum that colors represent materials, that colors arise from elements. And uh, we are still of a question as to whether or not the element itself is radiated or projected through its own color radiation. Is it possible that the light pouring apparently from a precious stone, but actually a light arising in the sun and reflecting the light of the stone, is this actually carrying some form of specialized energy? Energy that differs according to the color and may also differ according to the chemical composition of the material. Do we take in through the eye some subtle amount of chemistry derived from the color factor. We know that the same apparent color, or a very similar one which we can scarcely distinguish, uh, can arise from different chemical combinations. Therefore, all red is not the same. It is this chemical emanation problem uh, one in which different kinds of red, we will say, can variously be recorded within the consciousness of the person. Do these stones carry some kind of life energy with them? We go back to Paracelsus, who had many opinions on many subjects. And while we regard uh, these views today rather dimly, we cannot say that we have ever actually disproved them. We have simply dropped them as being inconsistent with the general body of our thinking. Paracelsus was of the basic opinion that minerals and stones and metals were actually living things. And that therefore a beautifully cut stone was not merely a thing of beauty. It was a center of energy. It had a nature, force, or quality of itself. This, of course, has been one of the questions that has been difficult to answer. But if it may be assumed that there is any kind of a definite key energy related to these different compounds, then, of course, it is conceivable that this energy may be communicated through the eye of the beholder and may have some form of a subtle reaction upon the life or consciousness of the person. Paracelsus might be inclined to assume that it was the energy that created this consequence. The modern thinker would be more assume, likely to assume that color symbolism was the true or important factor that the human soul does respond to color, that color therapy is valid, and that color is as distinct and important in the treatment of disease as sound, 
another way of reaching into the unconscious source of man's difficulties. Paracelsus also assumed that when these stones had been cut with certain mathematically designed figures, certain formulas, symbols, or the representations of creatures or deities, or the mysterious cabalistic symbols of the signatures of angels and of demons and of beings of the invisible world, that these stones then gained increasing intensity of purpose and that into them could be captured various magical agents that could profoundly influence human life. Paracelsus therefore used precious stones in the healing of disease. And at one time it was not uncommon to grind them up and take them dissolved in wine as an internal medicine. Uh, the effect of such internal medication is perhaps somewhat a problem, but you may remember that the late Rudolf Steiner worked considerably on this problem in connection with his theory of remedies. He's going so far as to make use of meteoric metals in the preparation of medications for human use. The subject may never be completely solved to everyone's satisfaction, but the fact remains that among the ancients it was definitely assumed that the mineral and the precious stone were both living things, and being alive had some energy in them, an energy that could be communicated to persons. Uh, we have many reports, either traditional or semi-historical, of the effects of various people upon jewels. That when, when certain persons wear these stones, the stones lose their luster or become comparatively unimportant. Whereas another person wearing them, the stone itself appears to change. Is this a meaning that might indicate that the individual has emanations, which in turn can affect the stone? We have to realize basically that stones, like everything else in the universe, are rates of vibration. And therefore that various vibratory patterns can affect each other, perhaps only slightly, but still to the degree of producing some modification that could be sensed or realized or known. All these different speculations lead finally to one rather cons a consistent body of symbolic lore. And that relates primarily with the use of these stones uh, by means of astronomical or astrological calculations or by Kabbalism and magic. One of the earliest sources, for example, of the concept of birth stones or the stones which are closest in affinity to individuals born in various months of the year, fortunate stones, or protective stones. The earliest pattern of this probably is derived from the breastplate of the high priest of Israel, where the 12 tribes of uh, Israel were represented by 12 precious stones, or 12 precious and semi-precious stones. These, therefore, became talismanic or symbolic of the members of the tribe. The twelve tribes were at an early date identified with the zodiac. Therefore, it was only a little time before the gems of the tribes became diffused through the constellations. And it looked very much to ancient man that a star shining in the sky was a kind of diamond set up there. And as the stars themselves often showed distinct coloring, all did not shine with the same clear white light. The possibility of an affinity between stars and stones grew in the primitive thinking of mankind. After the association with the uh, breastplate of the high priest, the idea of talismanic stones and religious gems as birth stones passed through a very wide variety of adaptations. Until today, we can call upon the symbolism of a dozen countries and probably as many periods in history 
uh, to come to some common conclusion as to how these stones were distributed. It might be pointed out, as always, that there is not complete agreement. The Arabs had one concept, the early Jewish writers had another, the early Christian writers had another still. In the Far East also, symbolic stones have become important in many magical and mystical ways. Their symbolism does not always conform entirely with that of Western peoples. So we have a distribution here of beliefs and ideas. But one point remains, the tendency to associate the stones with the months of the birth of the person, his ruling planets and stars, and uh, particularly the planetary ruler of his nativity. Uh, these stones are then supposed to support or assist or protect or add to the importance of the good qualities bestowed by the stars. Therefore, also, they were protective against various evil forces. It is quite possible, in fact, considerable thinking has been done in this field, that there is a basic color key by means of which persons born under various signs can be, we will say, particularly approached or reached in terms of energy that each of the twelve signs bestows upon those born under it a key color note. That this color is associated very definitely with the subconscious root of the psychological life of that person. That this color becomes an important key to his own life. He may or may not be aware of this color. He may accidentally have a selectivity about it. He may prefer certain colors. But it is assumed in the old ways that if the color key is found, then this color key can supply some information about stones and fabrics and uh, various color patterns which are used by people in their daily living might even affect your selection of the color of your automobile. That uh, many people differ in their color choice. And what looks like a beautiful shade to one person is an ugly color to another, indicates this basic individuality, that these color patterns do not necessarily always agree. Colors are also associated with certain important episodes in the life and death of the human being. And in the West, for example, black has always been associated with death. In Asia, the tendency is for white to take its place. So that uh, here we have an almost complete opposition of belief, or a contrary. Now why should we have this? Does it have something to do with the kind of belief that we hold about death? For instance, would the consideration of black as a color of death uh, be more common with a people whose optimism about the after-death state is not too great? In other words, if death is a disaster, perhaps black, which is a negative color, would be suggested. Whereas if death is regarded as a fulfillment, a release into a larger life, then the element of mourning would largely disappear from it. And the idea of the white light, which would be a symbol of spirit in opposition to black, which is a symbol of matter, would cause these people to use a color consistent with their hope or their viewpoint or their conviction about the state of life after death. It is also true that in uh, stylization, Patterns have been derived as to public attitude and change of color, style, decoration, and ornamentation. Uh, there has been a certain amount of work done to indicate that as social conditions change, as economic problems vary, they are reflected in the colors people choose to wear, or in the more uh, prominent and fashionable colors of the decor of their homes and things of that nature. 
Thus, color consciousness may very largely explain uh, the importance of the precious stone in the life of the person. It is an, uh, an intimate color association. It is also a status symbol. The individual possessing a rare and valuable object is undoubtedly psychologically influenced by this fact alone. This object bestows a certain sense of superiority of possession upon the owner. It causes this owner to have a certain internal increase in the sense of self-importance, which can psychologically have an effect upon his life or character. Thus, uh, the explanations are numerous, but the uh, true explanation perhaps will not be known for a long time. We also realize that various minerals and stones have very definite properties which differ, so that some, like the lodestone, are known to possess magnetic factors. Others are not so well recognized in this. Uh, but the titanite, for example, is a stone which of itself and naturally is luminous in the dark. This type of situation indicates a different kind of chemical construction. And this type of difference has been of interest to peoples from a, for a very long time. We know also that in the early development of peoples, Certain types of stones, particularly the nearly complete transparencies, such as crystal or the diamond, have had a peculiar and wonderful fascination. We do not know at what remote time the crystal became involved in divination, but it was certainly a long time ago. And as, a, as an object of divination, it has influenced history for thousands of years. And this habit of the use of the crystals in divination uh, is very widespread. It is almost universal. So we can say to ourselves, what does this mean? Is this something that has brought certain stones into particular prominence in the respect and admiration of mankind? How has this affected uh, the reaction of man to the entire mystery of gems. Old times apparently made use of certain uh, preparations by which a stone was supposed to gain the power of mirroring or reflecting episodes and incidents occurring in the world. In the Central and South American area, it was customary to carve magic mirrors or magic glasses out of obsidian. Now obsidian was this mysterious black material like volcanic glass which was used in the making of the razor blades. A, a disc of obsidian would therefore be apparently a disc of jet or black. This jet or black disc was said to uh, be used by the magician. Uh, for the conjuring up of shadows or mysteries within the depth of the stone itself. It is, it is recorded, for example, that at the time of the um, occupation of Peru by uh, the Spaniards on the Pizarro, that uh, these native diviners, the magicians, looked in their obsidian mirrors to see whether or not uh, the colonists of the Spaniards would accept the ransom for their king. And when they realized that the Spaniards would take the ransom and still destroy the king, which was their intention, the uh, Incas refused to reveal their treasures. The king died, but the treasures were never found because the instructions shown in the obsidian mirrors indicated that it would be no use to try to pay off the Spaniards. You will never be able to do so. The uh, Indians were quite correct in their estimation of the circumstance of uh, whether they made use of magic mirrors or not. The Druids and other people used crystals of various kinds to focus the rays of the sun to light their altar fires at the sacred festivals of the year. 
Crystals cut into lens shape were used at an early time by the Romans as magnifying glasses and as a substitute for spectacles. Uh, the crystal was set vertically or on edge in a finger ring, and the person using it simply held up his hand and looked through the side of the stone. Uh, some of the emperors were said to have had these so perfectly prepared that they were able to look through them and see the action of armies in the field several miles away. Uh, this type of glass is found in many locations as an aid to vision. In fact, so uh, was used in China also at a comparatively old time. Um, the clear or clouded crystal balls or crystal discs used in divination have also uh, been subject to a lot of thought. Uh, some of the earliest ones have a smoky look. They are not uh, really clear. And this smoky look appears like clouds in a troubled sky. And uh, observers, students of the problem, have come to the conclusion that under psychic stress, these natural patterns in the crystal, these clouds and irregularities and tones and masses and shapes, uh, could very likely uh, be caused to appear to take specialized forms, or the diviner could see in these masses a likeness to a certain shape, much as in the reading of tea leaves, or perhaps more psychologically in the distinguishing of the images by the Rauschauk test, in which ink blots become symbolic according to the interpretive power of the person looking at them. So if these various shapes were naturally in the crystal, in the cloudy crystal, which uh, more, many times they were, then it would be quite possible to assume that they formed catalyzing agents, uh, points of focus or attention, and that the images seen in the glass actually were projected upon the glass by the person looking at it. That these shadows and shapes and visions were actually in the mind of the person, and that they were projected as visual phenomena into the glass. This would only mean one thing, that instead of having a magical lens which could foresee the future, you transfer this power of foresight to the person, assuming that the person might be in a better condition to have some extension of faculty or power than would the crystal, and that the vision seen in the crystal represent the psychic sensitivity of the person using it. There is much to support this in another way, because psychic sensitivity has nearly always been accompanied ultimately by some kind of psychic disaster. Uh, the psychic being unable to control his own procedures has gotten into trouble in nearly every instance. And this has been mirrored in his glass by the gradual changing of the forms and shapes which he sees, which from being in the beginning benevolent and friendly, very often end up as evil and monstrous shadows, fearful and, ter and terrible in their implications. This type of psychic sensitivity occurring in persons without such assistance would indicate that the, ch the transformation is due to psychic change within the consciousness of the individual. I mentioned last week a very famous example of this crystal situation in the shoe stone of Dr. John Dee. The shoe stone, in the, me in the sense of the Old English, meaning to show or reveal, the revealing stone, was a small sphere of crystal-like material, which Dr. D used on numerous occasions to enlighten and inform uh, Queen Elizabeth of England, Elizabeth the Great, of the impending changes of her fortune. It is said also that it was by means of this stone that John Dee accurately foresaw the famous gunpowder plot, which, uh, with the attempt of Guy Fawkes to blow up the House of Parliament. Dee saw the thing, or this incident, occur in his shoe stone. 
and reported it to the court, which immediately searched the properties and found the barrels of gunpowder in the basement of the House of Parliament. Uh, this caused, of course, Dr. D, as he himself tells us, to have every kind of preferment heaped upon him except any financial help when he needed it. <laughs> this was not at all appearing. The country was grateful up to the extent of no financial uh, cooperation. But this shoe stone, which is now in the British Museum, is a typical example, in all probabilities, of a focusing instrument for calling into focus the energies of the individual. In other words, these magic stones were sort of hypnotic agents. They reduced the individual into a kind of trance-like condition by means of which his own subjective life came to the surface as in the problem of dreams. Therefore, the vision in the, in the glass is similar to the vision in the dream. It is a pressure through from the subconscious, based either upon fact or upon some internal conviction about fact. It is perfectly possible for an individual to believe very firmly something that does not prove to be true. Under such condition, his believing may cause this image to be projected, but the event does not transpire. In order to understand the legitimate explanation of the event, such as Dr. John D. and the Guy Fawkes plot, it is necessary to assume that there is a communication, uh, an extrasensory band, by means of which, under certain conditions, the individual can tune in events uh, which are to come or which are occurring around him. Uh, then the, the glass simply becomes the catalyzing agent which throws him into a negative condition in which these images begin to move out from his own subconscious and are therefore apparently seen in the glass before him. Magical glasses of this nature are reported everywhere. And um, uh, we know that Cagliostro, the famous French magician, made use of these continuously in the development of his various esoteric arts and purposes, and also in healing, that it was possible uh, to diagnose disease by means of these lenses or these glasses. Where color also had importance, and in more recent times, legends relating to stones were used to tie them to the various months of the year so that they had some special or distinct meaning. So gathering these tables together, I made a little list which I thought was perhaps interesting and might be a little bit helpful. This does not represent, by any sense of the word, a unanimous accord. But we felt that if, out of, say, 18 tables, 12 or 14 agreed on a certain stone, that was the one we would use for our discussion anyway. And you can always get books in the libraries and things of that nature going further into this problem if you're interested. But why were some of these stones taken? In some instances, certainly for color, and in other instances, certainly for ancient meanings that might go back into the old religious mysteries and into the early beliefs of the Christian church. Uh, there's no doubt that stones became practically a method of distinguishing the orders and hierarchies both of the church and of the universe itself, so that there were stones for the orders of angels and archangels, the stones for the trinity, stones for the fallen angels, and all kinds of stones for that very low degree of fallen angel, which we now call humanity, which is somewhere at the bottom of the heap. In the old times, at least, the dominant stone given for January this doesn't follow exactly the astrological pattern. It was really their month stones, principally, in the old system. Of course, you can go more into detail and tie them directly with the signs if you want to, but most of the old books simply refer to them by the month over which they rule. The January uh, stone was given by most authorities to be the garnet. And the garnet might very well have to do with that. Uh, in the first place... January represents the beginning of something. It is a new thing. 
And wherever you have something new, you generally had related to it a stone of considerable color, of depth, and of strong hue. And the fact that the sun increases in light after the winter solstice would probably uh, associate it with a, a stone like the garnet. Uh, your positive stones, your active stones, are the ones that run through the reds and the violets and the orange shades. Your passive stones are the greens, uh, the blues, and the violets, particularly the lilacs and blue violets. So that the, uh, the fact that the uh, garnet was assigned to January would indicate, perhaps, uh, as the ancients believed, that it was a stone that bestowed light. Now, uh, in therapy in the Middle Ages, garnet was used as a medicine against uh, poor blood. If the blood was deficient, and in those days no uh, transfusions were possible, if the blood was deficient, it was believed that the garnet increased blood or brought back life therefore would be associated naturally with the beginning of the year. The stone of February was assigned as the amethyst. And the amethyst has very long been a stone associated with religion. It is a very important stone in the Roman Church, uh, particularly recognized as the symbol of the bishop or of some higher member of the clergy. The amethyst also... Uh, was regarded uh, by the ancients uh, as a stone of friendship, of fellowship, of fraternity, and perhaps has been closely associated with the commandment of Jesus to love one another. Therefore, the amethyst was a stone of service, a stone of dedication, and a stone of self-renunciation for common good. In more aggressive and positive forms, it was used as um, a means of bestowing dedication. Not so much courage as this peculiar devotion to principles or ideas. It was a stone also associated with self-sacrifice. So that the amethyst was an idealistic stone, a stone of man's faith in the substance of things hoped for, and his willingness to sacrifice and struggle for the attainment of intangible good good beyond the ordinary course of things. March was a difficult one because the testimonies were almost completely divided. There was a slight edge in favor of Jasper, but Bloodstone ran a close second. And to most people in this country, I believe, the Bloodstone is the more common association of the two. Uh, the Jasper is found more in Europe and in South Asia. But in any event, uh, the bloodstone or the jasper uh, seem to be uh, associated with the idea of sacrifice or martyrdom. And therefore, the bloodstone probably in Europe gained uh, belief because this month was, for many peoples, associated with the Easter season, especially in view of the older calendar systems. Uh, this was a symbol, therefore, of sacrifice. Jasper was a weapon uh, symbol. It was a symbol of offensive uh, protection. Uh, the bloodstone and the jasper, therefore, could both be defined as defenders of the faith. And uh, the bloodstone particularly represented the defender, the one who was ready to die for the cause, for the belief or would not, under any condition, sacrifice or compromise principles. It was the symbol of defense, of faithful stewardship, of continuing loyalty and abidance. Uh, April was again one that was a little difficult uh, to uh, nail down to one stone. But out of the general picture, the diamond came out as being the most dominant, which would again not be unreasonable, as April was the symbol of the vernal equinox and the annual birth of the sun. 
The sun, according to Paracelsus, had an affinity for the diamond. And the diamond was therefore the sun of the gem kingdom. It was the center around which all the other jewels, so to say, moved in their orbits. A number of interesting legends about diamonds have come down to us, not only such curses as the Hope Diamond and the various ill fortunes that have followed so many of these great stones, but some of uh, a more pleasant and amiable type. One of the interesting ones is that it was reported for nearly 500 years in Europe that if you put two diamonds in a little box and left them alone for three years and opened it, there'd be a third mysterious little diamond present. <laughs> now, this was, uh, of course, a very difficult thing to experiment on because it was, first of all, necessary to make sure that you had a properly balanced parents for this new diamond. You had to make sure that you had a mother and father diamond to work with in the first place. Uh, your chances of being certain on this were difficult. But uh, it was actually believed, and there are written re uh, reports of uh, apparently the highest validity, that diamonds, either in the ground or in other places, will increase if left alone for a long period of time. Also, several gem cutters have stated that diamonds will increase in size if completely left alone over a long period of years. Now, this has been another question. Do gems grow? Uh, there is some evidence to indicate that they do, that they do increase. In fact, they must have at some time passed through some form of growth or they wouldn't be here. And the fact that they are widely scattered uh, indicates that they had to have been precipitated in some way. And this precipitation may be a continuing process. Uh, the older lapidaries were quite, assert, quite certain that precious stones are still being made in the earth. And, uh, of course, your medieval philosopher had a whole group of little gnomes and something of that nature to do the hard work. We, uh, we don't consider that, but many specialists have insisted that stones do grow, therefore that they are alive, and that it is quite a mistake to assume that they are merely inanimate because they live in a level of energy consciousness different from our own. The diamond, by the way, was, among most people, the symbol of leadership, of preferment, of precedent. It was the symbol of honor, of truth, and of purity. Uh, somehow, go on the way, though, used to get into some rather uh, impure relationships with mankind. Uh, it was also always held, and magically true, that a stone, uh, the qualities of which were perverted by the owner, would turn upon and injure that owner. That if you had a certain stone, you must live up to it. If you do not live up to it, it will become an avenging force against you, on the assumption that its own energy never ceases. And therefore, if you go contrary to that energy, this energy sets up conflict within yourself. So the ancients advised persons who were not honorable not to wear these stones, because they would only uh, disgrace the stone and hasten the fall of their own dishonorable projects. The uh, diamond especially was therefore a symbol of purity, of integrity, of leadership, of honor, and of all things that were right and good. Now, May also had its stones, and they were quite numerous. And again, it was difficult out of the old pattern of things to select the ones, uh, that, the one that seemed to be the most outstanding. The most common one, when we got all through with it, was the agate. The agate seems to be uh, rather consistently the stone of this month. It will note, of course, that the stones vary in rarity considerably. Uh, apparently, there is no consistent list in which all of the months are represented by gems of top value. There are nearly always rare and less rare stones. The ancients said also that these represented 
the rare and the less rare virtues of mankind. There are some abilities, powers, and energies which are rarely distributed among men. There are others that are more commonly available, and therefore that these differences would naturally and properly be associated with the stones representing these energy fields. Now, the agate being associated with the month of May would seem to be quite reasonable and proper. This is a transitional month. It is a month going in toward the spring, toward summer and the planting and the various works and labors of men. And uh, in the ancient times, the agate became the symbol of industry. It became the symbol of lands and of properties, of stewardship and proprietorship, of trade and commerce and exchange, and uh, bestowed upon the individual uh, honesty in weights and measures, integrity in relationships, and uh, a strong merchandising instinct. Uh, the, this stone, therefore, was associated with practical success. And like success itself, it was stratified in many ways. For many persons feel success in different patterns or arrangements. So the person who fulfills his own purpose succeeds. And in the, in the story of the agate you have uh, much emphasis upon the person doing the things that he feels he is able to do, that he wants to do, and to find his satisfaction, his joy, and his fulfillment in adjustments in happy relationships with chosen fields of activity. That the person is truly happy who enjoys a good but moderate way of life. The agate was therefore peace through moderation, through intelligence, through discernment, through acceptances rather than through demands. And as the signs involved in this month are rather demanding, uh, in the astrological setup, it seems that this is especially a practical fragment of advice uh, to be uh, patient and pleased with the gentle things of life. Now, the month of June, uh, most of the writers decided was the emerald. And the, um, the emerald was a stone associated with the increase of the vitality of nature. The emerald was a stone that had to do with the whole earth. The earth with its marvelous greenery and its wonderful clothing of verdure, flowers and plants. The emerald became the symbol, therefore, of the beauty of nature, of all natural things and natural processes. And out of this concept of natural processes came one, of course, which all ancient peoples particularly recognized and admired, and that was the symbol of the home, the symbol of the family, the symbol of the of procreation in nature, the symbol of perpetuation and amity, and of personal affection between individuals. So the emerald came to be a symbol of fertility, of affection, of regard, of graciousness, of nature, and of simple natural ways of doing things, of love of art and nature, and uh, the fulfillment of the, the normal requirements of the rhythm of nature, which would be, of course, generation and harvesting and the storing up of supplies against the winter and all of these natural processes and through extension the emerald was a symbol of natural law within which all things must exist and by which they survive so it's a surviving symbol a glorifying of natural normal beautiful things and a life made ha happy by harmony and adjustment and fruitfulness and the sense of the rewards which are natural in good deeds graciously performed uh, the month of July we had a little trouble with because they couldn't really make up their minds, so we'll have to tell you what their general conclusions were. 
I think perhaps the onyx won by just a shade, just a tiny bit. But very close to it, and almost equal, was the turquoise. So I would say that uh, the two could share this distinction. I believe that the onyx, uh, the onyx represented more or less uh, the use of decoration or support or substance. Very often in ancient art, the onyx was used very generously to represent uh, royalty, distinction, and various honors. It, was, it had to do with pushing forward into things, to achieving things. Uh, it was a sign of temporal leadership. It was a sign of authority, the sign of the statesman, the governor, the leader, uh, either appointed or elected. And it was frequently used in connection with the ornamentations of objects of public office, such as seals and symbols of states and nations. It was also frequently a pedestal or base upon which something stood. All different types of this material, from rare to comparatively common, occurs in, occur in symbolism. But I think that the general theme or theory behind it is that it is the symbol of responsibility, that the individual must accept uh, the problems of leadership and must equip himself to carry responsibility with dignity for all things that come to us, whether it's a beautiful jewel or a job. Both present responsibilities which have to be met. And the individual who is not willing to care for that which he receives is unworthy to possess or to have or to enjoy. The turquoise is a sky symbol and was used among ancient peoples as a, ba as a veil, the blue veil or the sky ocean symbol that divided our world from the world of the divinities. Therefore, turquoise was a sign of the superiority of divine powers, again, of authority, uh, of uh, the leadership of the tribe, of honor and distinction, of valor and achievement. But in every case, it represented uh, the wisdom of experience of justice and of judgment. Therefore, to wear it indicated that you were a responsible person, uh, having assumed and carried the duties of your people. August was associated largely with the Carnelian. There seemed to be no great division of opinion in connection with this. This stone has to do uh, with the future. It was an ancient symbol of good things to come. It was a talisman for future good, to build now for the better day, far-sightedness, looking into tomorrow with hope and sagacity. It was also associated with patience, for all things that are important must be achieved patiently and without unreasonable haste or pressure of time. We might extend this, therefore, to mean a symbol of orientation and integration. The individual who has set his own life firmly upon a reasonable basis. That in full faith, acceptance, and understanding, he is building for the kind of future which he plans. And therefore, that he has become a director of his own destiny. Self-directed. Self-responsibility for self -action action and self-guidance. I think this would be the principal value or the symbolism of the Cornelium. The month of September has as its particular symbol the chrysolite. There seemed to be very little division of thinking on that particular subject. Uh, this is a symbol or a structure involved in reward. This is a sign uh, of what comes to the good and faithful servant. Therefore, it, uh, it draws to the individual, according to the old law, that which is his own, which he has earned. It is a certain pact between man and nature 
that man will be provided for if he keeps the doctrine, if he keeps the law, the law will keep him. Thus it has to do with the natural enjoyment of that which has been earned and was in old times often given to persons retiring into the older age brackets as an indication that the future shall be a peaceful and wonderful reward for work well done. And for the younger person, it is a reminder that work well done will have its reward. It is tightly tied in to compensation and to the integrities of labor by means of which we earn that which is good. It tells us to be ever mindful that there is a, a, an honesty in nature and that this honesty will not be defiled, that it will bring to us according to our own uh, achievements and our own understanding. Uh, the month of October was pretty nearly consistently bestowed to the burl, a very nice and not especially rare stone, but one in which uh, there is a great deal of interesting symbolism. The burl is the symbol of the individual's ability to control the pressures of his own personality. October is a month of great pressure. And the burl is a symbol, and was to the old peoples, uh, a sign of contentment as being uh, a simple acceptance of things as they are, the ability to sense and see good in the immediate, to say not how I wish for something, but how grateful I am for what has already come to me. Therefore, the burl makes the individual mindful internally of the beauty, the truth, the love, and friendship he has enjoyed through the years. It is therefore a symbol of the good memory of things that uh, enrich us because we can draw them back to consciousness. It is the person who has the jewel of happiness in his own heart and mind. The burl is therefore this heart-mind stone that if we will read its mystery correctly, it will shine out always, telling us of the wonderful privileges and joys we have known, even though sometimes we become a little dissatisfied. The uh, November stone is the topaz, and this stone is a suggestion of adjustment. The topaz comes in many colors, like the sapphire. It has a many splendored glory, and in this diversity, uh, the November individual uh, is uh, inspired to see or to understand uh, the many phases of good or the many phases of blessings or the many div divine privileges that we enjoy and also how we can express outwardly in many ways. The uh, topaz is the symbol of the radiance of the enlightened person shining his light into many lives of different colors and kinds and adding new luster to all of them. Also, the topaz points out that each person lives many lives himself and that the power of light brings color to all of them so that in business and home, in art, music, literature, whatever he may be interested in, it is the light of his own understanding that makes all these things shine beautifully and gloriously. So the topaz reminds each person of the light in himself and that the jewels of the world shine according to the light that he sheds upon them. He must make the jewels to shine according to the old legends. And if he will add his own light, then the luster will be great and beautiful and permanent. December was given to the ruby with all very little difference of opinion. And this would be natural because ruby is the symbol of blood. And each year the world hero dies at the winter solstice, uh, the victim of the conspiracy of darkness. Therefore, blood becomes the symbol of the blood pact, of blood brotherhood. Uh, blood in the ruby is the symbol uh, that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son into this world to die for men. This was the early Christian symbol of martyrdom. 
The ruby was the symbol of the glory of self-sacrifice, that the most wonderful privilege in all the world is to forget self in the service of that which is greater than self. Therefore, in each life a self must die and its blood must be shed, that an eternal self may be born therefrom. And as the phoenix rises from the ashes of its own dead, so the ruby is the symbol of the mysterious resurrection of life from death, the mysterious shedding of blood, which is a symbol of man giving his life for his friend. So the ruby was thus an emblem of self-sacrifice, of martyrdom, but also of a victorious uh, release, a victorious achievement. The person uh, who wears the ruby was supposed, therefore, to be one uh, who has risen out of his own past, transcended his own sorrows, and has dedicated himself completely and full-heartedly uh, to the bringing of joy and peace and happiness to his world. The willingness to give of self, not what he has, but what he is. Therefore, in general, the stone is heroic unselfishness and the good that it can produce for all people in the world. Now, there is so much more that we could say, but our time is so much up, I guess we're just going to have to stop and let everybody somewhere along the line get a cup of coffee out in the patio, which I believe is being saved for this occasion. I think they figured that everyone would be exhausted and would need one by this time. Next Sunday morning, our subject is Health and the Zodiac, an introduction to astropsychology, and we hope that you'll be interested in it. I'd like to also say that we have a new manuscript uh, lecture notes on the table on the re-education of public opinion, a lecture for which we had a great many requests. We also have a, a record that was uh, used at the Christmas season and broadcast over a number of radio stations in which I read from our book, uh, The Ways of the Lonely Ones, two stories, The Face of Christ and The Master of the Blue Cape. That is now available in recorded form. I'd like to also say that those of you who are interested in the uh, Buddhist pictures that we advertised in some publicity material which you may have received recently, due to the uh, limitation of space in the lobby, we are unable to, to spread these out adequately. They can be seen in the library after the lecture and can be also secured there if you are desirous of getting them. Incidentally, we have a new library exhibit this morning which has to do with our own country and uh, some of our religious and folk art and uh, lore, so we hope that you will find it interesting. And uh, don't forget, the coffee clatch will be waiting for you as you enthusiastically depart from here. Thank you very much.